It's time now to introduce our keynote speaker. Distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley was until recently the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Massey University. He's the author or editor of 27 books, the most recent being Rebooting the Regions 2016. He's currently writing two books, one on social and demographic change in New Zealand, while the other concerns the extreme right in this country. He's a program leader of a research program on the impacts of immigration and diversity in Aotearoa with a funding of $5.5 million. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 2011 and was granted the title of Distinguished Professor by Massey University in 2013. He was awarded the Science and Technology Medal by the Royal Society in 2009 and he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley in 2010. And since 2013, he has been a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Gottingen, Germany, most recently in 2019. It gives me great pleasure <laughs> to now invite distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley to the stage as tonight's keynote speaker with his talk title, Hate Speech, What Have We Learned Since 15 March and What Can We Do Now? He poe poe a o o takiri mai te ata kore hita manu kau 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 te a e na manu na waka na reo o na manu fenu a na tifa tu a te na kau te e te kama tu a na mihi kia koe e hua ma kiora mai ano te na kau te te na kau te kiora tata kato salam alaikum shalom thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. And I want to acknowledge a very esteemed panel that's going to speak alongside me. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge our visitor who's just arrived for his and the community's wisdom and humility in very difficult circumstances. Um, as we remember what happened a year ago, just over a year ago, um, it is very, very difficult to know the words to, to express particularly to those who are directly affected by what has happened. So all I can say is that um, uh, to echo the Prime Minister, you are one of us and it is very important that we keep saying that. Look, I've got uh, about 10 minutes to, to say some words which I hope offer um, some insight, but not necessarily hope. Um, what I, want to, uh, what I want to suggest is that I was asked to talk about what was different about post-Christchurch. And in terms of the work that I've been doing around uh, hate speech, I'm not sure that pre-Christchurch and post-Christchurch are that different, to be honest. And Andrew and I were part of a meeting between the Muslim leadership of uh, New Zealand and various government departments in 2017. Um, February, wasn't it, Andrew? I keep forgetting. <laughs> March, oh, I, I forgot already. Um, and um, in, that, in that meeting, there were some, some things that were said to our leaders of our government departments uh, who appear not to have been, those comments appear not to have been heard. And then in mid-2017, um, I chaired a, a, a group that was looking at hate speech in this country. And what happened was that uh, mid that year, of course, um, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux arrived here, and suddenly the interest in hate speech evaporated and we got a, um, a focus on free speech. So I want to acknowledge the um, Pearl of the Islands Foundation for, for arranging this, because I think we need to keep talking about it. And the questions that I was asked to address is whether or not hate speech has become normalised any word yes, I think it has. Um, what's the social harm that's been caused and how can we respond to it? What has happened when you look at what's, what has happened around the world um, is that you've seen an escalation in online hate speech, particularly since 2016. And it's quite extraordinary. It doesn't matter where you go, whether you look at the work that's been done by Hadaya or the work that's been done by the Anti-Defamation League, it's the same message. And that is on year on year, there's been an escalation in the amount of um, hate speech that is available. 
And of course, the factor that's changed really has been the uh, possibility of the internet. And I would just like to, I would just like to invite all of us, whatever we do in our daily lives, we must understand that the world is changing enormously because of what the internet has done to it, and that there's a not only a technological transformation, but there is a philosophical and a political transformation that's happening. The problem is not free speech. The problem is an excess of information. And the growth of that information has privileged opinion over fact. So that the second part of what's happening is that the volume of material uh, has just increased. And so the world that I do research in, my, my first book on, on the far right in New Zealand was published in 1987. And What's happened to that world of hate is that it has expanded as the internet has expanded. So it makes it very much harder to reach a consensus unless we can talk to one another. Because if our talk, if our conversations are mediated by the internet, then we're in um, some trouble. Because not only has the internet and the world of the internet, the digital world, not only has it increased um, the possibilities for extreme groups, but it's also increased other things, the, the degree of scepticism. There is often a low level of trust in our core institutions, including the media. So we have these very alternative information sources, and I'm putting quotation marks around that, in which there's no moderation. And one of the things that I have to do as part of my research for this book is look at the dark web. And it's a deeply depressing place. And it's one that, you know, you come out of and thinking, where can I get some um, fresh air and light in my world? Um, and you will have probably heard about 4chan and 8chan, but there's a whole lot of websites. And what's, what's happening is that these websites are now on decentralized platforms like ZeroNet, which are hosted by the users. So um, I'm going to talk in a second about the, um, how the main online platforms have reacted. But these are not platforms that are subject to material being taken down or moderated or reacted to. They are self-determining in every sense of the word. And of course, what's happened in that world is that disinformation, defamation, racial vilification has increased. Um, I've been um, influenced, and I've brought one of the books along, I've been very influenced by a book that came out last year by Nazreen Malik. We need new stories challenging the toxic myths behind our age of discontent. And Nazreen and another um, writer who I really do value, Rennie Eldo Lodge, she wrote a book, um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. The, the title's very provocative. It's a very good book. Um, the, both of them argue that the idea that somehow free speech is under threat at the moment and the sort of enlightenment values of open debate um, as being threatened uh, is, is really incorrect. And both of them argue that what's happening is that these extreme views and the people, the activists who, who advocate for them, are wanting to secure the right to speak without impunity. Um, so it's simply not only more speech, but that somehow bigotry has become a legitimate point of view. And um, that when they don't get the right to speak, it leads to outrage. The other thing that I think has happened is that we've, we're starting to get new arguments occurring. And I don't know whether many of you have um, seen or heard about the Renal Camus book. Uh, which was published in French in 2011 and English in 2012, in which he argued that the white Western world was being reverse colonised by non-whites, and he talks about the Great Replacement. And, of course, that Great Replacement idea has been now central to many of the politics that we've seen emerge. Can I come to the second question that the um, uh, Pearl of the Islands Foundation asked me to address, and whether or not... Uh, this speech is having an impact upon our community. And, and the 15th of March tells us immediately it has. I mean, I think the answer to that is, is, is um, self-obvious. 
Um, but there's also now very good research, particularly in Europe and the United States, in which the increase in hate speech has real world impacts. For some of us who wrote about what happened a year ago uh, in the last few days, I know Anjum has and, and others have, um, we get people responding to what we're saying um, with hate. And for me, what is difficult talking to many New Zealanders is that they s do not understand what the impact of that is on communities. And of course, it is largely invisible to them. But there's some very good research in Europe which shows that the increase in hate speech online leads to hate crimes. And when there's outages in the internet, there is a decline both in hate speech and also in hate crimes. How do we know what's happening in New Zealand? We don't. All we know is the experience of the people, some of whom are in this room, in terms of being the targets of hate speech. Many New Zealanders, most New Zealanders, are not, do not experience hate speech because many of them, of course, are not members of ethnic and religious minorities. I would dearly love us to have material that is available in other countries around exactly what is happening online, particularly in this fraught area. NetSafe action stations do a great job and are telling us a little bit, but we've got a complaints-based system or a system that responds to individuals, and even then possibly not adequately. We don't know the extent of hate speech. So in answer to one of the other questions, is it growing, is it declining? My sense is it's growing, but we don't have very hard evidence of that. There are some good, uh, good examples, by the way, of communities and organisations responding to this hate speech. Um, I'm in c uh, contact with Tell Mama, which is a British um, organisation which is doing a fantastic job. Um, there's remote hate, Remove Hate from the Debate, uh, all together now, online hate prevention, and there's the Unmanifesto campaign, which is a really interesting um, organisation which takes the manifestos of these hate groups and changes them. So NetSafe action stations, the e-safety research, if we want a sense of what's happening out there, um, the Human Rights Commission, Kororo, uh, Whakamaua Hawara, the hate speech, are all places where you can begin to understand what hate speech does in contemporary New Zealand. Can I finish just by um, talking really about some of the things that um, I think need to be contested. Um, the first is that um, in opposition to hate speech, as we found with Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux, was that free speech arguments were made. There's no such thing as free speech in this country. There are all sorts of restrictions on speech. And I find it ironic that parliamentarians talk about the importance of free speech when in the House their speech is limited in all sorts of ways um, that even you and I uh, don't experience. So the first thing I would like to argue very strongly is that we don't have unlimited free speech, we have all sorts of restrictions. The second myth, I think, is that it's too hard to define hate speech. No, it's not. Um, um, I, I wrote a, when, when I was chairing this, this group, I wrote a little paper and I looked at all the defi definitions of hate speech. I'd be quite happy to use the definition of Facebook. It's got a perfectly good definition of hate speech. Um, there's nothing wrong with our Section 61 of the Human Rights Act, except it's not inclusive. It doesn't include a whole lot of groups that should be included. And the minister's signalled that he's going to, to look at that. So let's be up front and say that hate speech is not part of our community. The third myth, I think, is that somehow hate speech is not a threat to our society and to particular communities in it. It absolutely is. And I think you're going to hear from one or two other speakers who will definitely make that point. Hate speech 
and its escalation, particularly since 2016, is one of the issues that we should come together as a community and say it is not r acceptable for members of our community to face racial or religious vilification in any way, shape or form. Let's talk about the threshold, let's talk about the severity test that we need to apply, because we don't want to limit um, debate, but we definitely need to have that debate and to realise that it is having an impact on the safety and the well-being of members of our community. I think the fourth thing that we need is greater literacy, in particular digital literacy. I think we need to be able to understand what is happening on the internet and to be able to respond to it. I don't think legislation is the answer, but I think it's part of the answer. So I'm very supportive of the Minister Andrew Little and what he's trying to do to increase the protected characteristics. But legislation and criminal prosecution should be part of the array of weapons that we have. But it might, in my view, it should not be the first or the most important array. What we need is to be talking as communities to one another, to bear in mind what happened after the 15th of March and has happened again more recently, and to begin to talk. Because one of the things that I'm very clear about is that if we talk to each other online, it's not going to work. We need to talk in other ways. So digital, digital literacy. Despite that rather pessimistic uh, view of hate speech and whether it ha has increased or decreased, my view is that it has continued as much the same prior to um, the 15th of March 2019. It continues much the same now. And I think what we've got to do is recognise that the ecology, the opportunities for hate speech are now very different from what they were five or 10 or 20 years ago. So we need new weapons in our, arp in our armory. It's probably a bad example to use. We need new strategies to respond, um, to, respond to, to what's happening. And when I um, wrote the uh, piece for um, the group that I was chairing at the time, one of the things that I wanted to um, look at, and which I think we need to come back to, is to begin to look at what those other strategies look like. What are we going to do to minimise, uh, neutralise hate speech? And I think this community is small enough, this community being New Zealand, this community is small enough, it has good leadership, and I'm including their political leadership, and when I say political leadership, I mean also in the religious communities. I think we have an opportunity to lead the world in this new age of digital hate. And I will keep using the word hate because it is hate, and we need to recognise it as such and we need as a community to say it is not all right. Kia ora tata katoa.